Hello, welcome to the Jack and Jack show. Jack Stroud alongside me and Jack, a third win away from home this season in the Premier League for Fulham and confirmed status for a third consecutive Premier League season. Uh, it, it's been a phenomenal, well, it was a phenomenal day on Sunday. How are you? Very well, very well, thank you. Thank you for having me back on. Um, and yeah, a, a, a very enjoyable Sunday. Um, West Ham isn't a ground that we normally get too much joy at. Mm. So it was quite nice to um, to not only win there, but to you know do the double over them in mm. quite convincing fashion as well. Yeah, it's our first double of the season, which seems bizarre because we've had such, such a good season, but obviously away from home, we, we haven't been as good. And also, um, we haven't beaten West Ham in the league since about 2001 or 2002 yeah. or something. So um, it was a long time coming, even at Upton Park, you know, a ground we just couldn't get anything from we would draw we would lose we we couldn't win and then london stadium that's our fourth time playing at the london stadium i think where yeah. we lost 3-1 3-1 last season 1-0 in lockdown thanks to adam O'Lookman's shocking bounty and uh and then this one on sunday 2-0 win happy days andre Pereira at the double before we get into it let's just uh have a word from our sponsors green king sports we thank them again for their sponsorship this season and uh if you can't make it to a game, especially if you can't make it to Fulham Liverpool, which is on TV this weekend, head down to a Green King pub and you'll be able to catch the action there. Um, bit of a weird weekend in the Premier League, given this FA Cup action. Um, Wallen Green play Manchester City and Coventry, of course, play Manchester United. So um, there's a team in, I think, Tottenham Hotspur who miss out on a Premier League fixture this weekend. Um, but there's still plenty of games on the box. On Saturday, you've got... The 7.30 kickoff, Wolverhampton Wanderers hosting Arsenal, who lost to Villa, of course, at the weekend. It's all getting a little bit tense at the top. Uh, down the bottom on Sunday, 1.30 kickoff, Everton at home to Nottingham Forest. A massive game. I mean, that is as big a game as you'll ever get. Uh, and a very big game as well at Craven Cottage, uh, the second part of Super Sunday. Fulham hosting Liverpool. We've already hosted them once this season in the Carabao Cup semi-final. Uh, we've been there twice to Anfield and lost 2-1 and 4-3. So maybe this time, after a very morale-boosting win, uh, we might, Jack, beat Liverpool. Let's, let's We'll come on to Liverpool in a bit. Let's start with West Ham. Um, it was pretty tricky getting into the ground. One very long queue. I think the turnstiles were playing up a little bit, which is frustrating. We got in about two or three minutes into the game. And then Andres Pereira pops up. Mavro Panos with the error. And Pereira doing what he did last season and just sticking one in their goal hole. Um, uh, you know, after five minutes last season and 10 minutes this season, great start for Fulham. And well, actually, we, we rode a bit of a storm early on as well with Antonio. Yeah. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, rode a bit of a storm. Antonio probably should have scored. Um, mm. Chance kind of called, come down to him after Leno parries from Kufau. Um, and then, yeah, ball over the top from Iwobi. I think he's looking for Muniz and Mavropanos gets himself in a little bit of a muddle, doesn't have to clear it or bring it down. In the end, he does neither. Um, mm -hmm. Quite fitting, actually, Mavropanos being a player that we were linked with in the summer. Um, yes. You know, and we chose to go for Calvin Bassi instead, who had a fantastic game. Yeah. Um, but Andres Pereira, the ball comes down to him and he's still got a bit to do, to be fair, to get round Fabianski. And then it's a, it's a finish right into the top, into the kind of top of the net. Um, mm. And yeah, fantastic start for Fulham. Very similar to um, obviously this time last season as well. Um, not so much this time, but last season at the at the London Stadium where Fulham started the game brightly and managed to nick a goal from Andreas Pereira. Um, but a completely different outcome in terms of performance. I thought Fulham were fantastic on Sunday. Um, you know, partially down to maybe West Ham being a little bit leggy from Thursday night, but I'm not going to give them that. I think Fulham were really good as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, 2-0 uh, on another day could have easily been 3 or 4. Honestly, yeah, it could have been. We had loads of good chances. Um, Muniz with a header that actually was much closer than I thought at, at the time. It was during a, a minute's applause, mm -hmm. and um, which is kind of a weird time to score. Like, it, it would have been weird if we'd have scored. It almost would have been disrespectful if we'd have scored. We'll, we'll come on to... Uh, the George Earthy incident a little bit later. I want your take on that as well. Um, but but Muniz almost scoring, and then he almost scored a back kill. You know, it feels like we can't go for a game without <laughs> seeing Muniz try something extravagant, whether he pulls it off or not. He's still much loved by the fans. Um, 
Pereira, uh, he enjoyed himself. There was some really good match of the day too. Analysis on him, uh, some Brazilian flicks and tricks. He was he was pulling out, and you know what? I mean, you look at the Nottingham Forest game where we lost, and Pereira was our best player on the pitch. And then we played Newcastle where he was a little, he was he was all right. He wasn't great. And um, and then on Sunday, he was really good. And it was very evident, you know, Marcus said it after the game, where he wanted um, Pereira to, to basically occupy himself throughout the whole game in between the lines, breaking into the box. And that's basically how he got his first goal. And then the second goal, he plays about one ball, continues his run. And it's a very simple finish. It, West Ham defended pretty poorly for both our goals, really. And uh, we'll take it. I've got to say, though, you're right. Calvin Bassey was brilliant. And, and a lot of the post-match thoughts from neutrals watching and West Ham fans were like, oh, Tosin's fantastic. And I thought, yeah, Tosin had a good game, but Bassey was the better of the two for me. Um, yeah, it was a very strong performance from Fulham. Um, it never felt like we were going to concede, even though West Ham had really good chances um, at times. I think we restricted them really well in the second half. And, you know, we've seen this so much in West Ham. You know, they, they they usually concede early and they really step it up in the second half and really turn the screw. But we never really got that sort of onslaught, that sort of storm that we had to ride. They had a couple of chances and Kudos was ineffective. Paqueta was a bit pathetic at times. He probably should have been sent off, I think, for a foul on, yeah, yeah. on, on Lukic in added time. I just thought the whole West Ham performance was a bit meh. And obviously, they've just come off a defeat against the Bayer Leverkusen team who are now 43 games unbeaten and have won Bundesliga. Um, so congratulations to them. But yeah, back to Fulham. Very solid, very good. Muniz, like, didn't have, you know, didn't score, didn't have his best game, but he was still very effective, held up the ball well and could have scored a couple of times. And Awobi, brilliant. Brilliant from Alex Awobi. Uh, he probably should have scored a couple of times. Good save from Fabianski. Hit a shot wide in the first half. Uh, Jacket was okay. We've won three games away from home this season. Does that rank as the best away performance? I mean, United was very good, but but in terms of we kept a clean sheet, we restricted West Ham to chances. But but United game obviously was was a very good performance as well. And of course Everton, but we were absolutely <laughs> we were thrashed by Everton without them scoring a goal really. Yeah, the Everton one, I think you can put to one side and take that out of the debate and um, between yeah. which one was the better performance. I think both were brilliant. I think, yeah, Fulham were very good value throughout the game. And, you know, West Ham didn't create anything, but that was a testament just to how well Fulham played. And, yeah. you know, Calvin Bassett, we've mentioned, was fantastic. A lot of plaudits towards to Tosin. Maybe that's because he's been linked to West Ham in the week and they're trying to make themselves feel a little bit better about the fact that, you know, they lost, but maybe we're going to sign him. Um and then obviously Polinia was brilliant as always, won the ball back for the second goal. Sasha Lukic had quite a good game as well in the middle of the park. Um, and it was just a real, just kind of comfortable day at the office for Fulham. Um, mm. And, you know, as you mentioned, we've been very frustrating away from home, especially in, in recent weeks. You know, Sheffield United was a, a ludicrous day, but, you know, it was a pretty poor performance um, defensively. Mm. Yeah, um, and then Nottingham Forest in that first half was just a complete mess, and you know, to it was a little bit like chalk and cheese in terms of in terms mm. of the performances, and you know, that's a real testament to just Fulham and just the way that we've been, the way that we've, we've played, and to, to bounce back from a, a few really difficult results um, is is just a real testament to Marco Silva and his is you know his confidence in the team, and you know, I think everyone had a real solid performance. Moon is, as you mentioned, he didn't score or didn't assist, but his, his hold up play was good and got some flick ons. And, you know, we still had chances. Um, Alex Awobi was brilliant. And as you mentioned, probably could have scored as well. And mm. yeah, it was just a really kind of routine, just a nice day at the office for Fulham. Yeah. It felt like some sort of cup game where we were playing a team in the lower division. And I don't want to mean disrespectful to West Ham because obviously I think they are as good, if not a better team than us. And they've demonstrated that over the last few years, but they just weren't at the races. And actually, you know, if Antonio would have stuck that in early, early, early on, it would have been a completely different game. Um, but, you know, you've got to take your chances and we did. And of course we had loads of chances against Newcastle and didn't take them. So it was nice to see us um, score a couple of goals uh, and of course keep a clean sheet as well. What does it mean for the table? Uh, 42 points from 33 games. And I think... This is exactly what happened last year. 39 points, and then we went to Everton. I've said it before. We went to Everton, and we won there 3-1. We are on 42 points. From I, I believe it must have been 32 or 33 games. So it's very similar trajectory. We've got five games left. 
You know, catching Chelsea might be a tall order now with their five points ahead with a game in hand. Fair enough. Everton just did not turn up last night. That's fine. Um, I, I think that even if we don't finish in the top half, we finish around, I don't know, 47, 48, 50 points. If we don't beat the points out of last season, I, I, it's been a very similar season. And uh, we, we've still got two more away games in Brentford and Luton. If we won those, it'd be five away games for the season. So that's quite good going. And of course, you look at the Burnley game, we probably should have won that. Should have got a point at least out of Liverpool, our next opponents as well. Uh, and then just finally, I mean, it caused a bit of a stir. From my perspective, you know, George Earthy went down. It looked it, it looked bad, obviously, and it looked bad. There was some distress. But when you're in a way end, and especially when you're at West Ham as well, which is probably the, I wouldn't say the worst away end of, of, in, in the ground, but it's it's far away from the pitch. And most of the noise was coming from the top tier who were uh, furthest away from the pitch. So they would have little idea as to the extent of the injury. But also we were tuning up and having quite a nice time. And it all seemed, yeah, if it was maybe, I don't know, uh, Madra Panos who was down or, or Kufau who was down, Sufau who was down, then maybe, it, but because it was an academy player and he was young and he just came on, I could understand the frustration and the, 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 the you know, they called us classless. And I, I think that it's a complete exaggeration. They're just sort of trying to deflect their defeat and trying to point fingers should we have chanted through that period? Yeah, it's it's we're winning two 0 We we very very rarely win in a way, and a break in play does give a chance for the fans to sort of, you know, have a sing song and sort of go, oh, this is great, isn't it? But obviously, context: a, a young lad is down. He's obviously maybe been knocked out, and it's it's hard to realise that when you're in the crowd and you've had a few beers as well. So I don't think I thought some of the reaction from those West Ham fans to the, to the left of us was just so over the top would you know if jay stansfield or luke carries or marshall Godo they went down under a similar challenge and we heard some fans singing in the putt in the end would we react the same maybe there'd be a little bit of riffraff at the back of the hammersmith end i could completely imagine that but i thought the overreaction is tough to say because you could get torn apart for saying things like this but i think that we were well within our right to enjoy ourselves you know it's not like it, okay, it's a very difficult situation. When when Basham went down, you could clearly see that his leg was basically dangling off, and that's gonna that's gonna silence anyone. But from all the way back at the, the top tier of West Ham, you're not going to be able to see the extent of the injury. Therefore, I think it's a bit of a mountain out of a molehill. Albeit, we wish that we wish George Earthy very very well, and hopefully he has a speedy recovery and gets back on the pitch because um, he looked the prospect. Your take on it, if if you have one. I think you've kind of put the nail on the head. I think it's a little bit of a mountain out of a molehill. You know, when you're at West Ham, it's you, you, you've you kind of tried to be very um, on on the fence a little bit. It is a terrible away end and you are you are miles away from it. You don't really understand what's going on and you don't know the, the severity of certain situations. And Fulham fans aren't like that. They're not a club. Who, we're not a club who, you know, kind of, we'd, no one saw him go down and say, right, we're going to chant and take the piss. Like, that's just not... Yeah, exactly. Like, it wasn't that. That's just not. That's just. That's just not. That's just not in full of And yeah, we were good. Good having a, an enjoyable time out, and you know, we turn it up, and it's you want to get behind the team. Obviously, I wasn't there, so I don't really know the full extent of of what happened. Um, but you know, it's. I, I think it's a bit of a bit of an, an over exaggeration in terms of calling Fulham fans classless and, and all of this sort of sort of stuff because I mean again I wasn't there but obviously when he went off everyone applauded him and if if, if Fulham fans were classless and and didn't care and wanted to take the mick they wouldn't have done that they would have just they'd have carried on and maybe he would have like ripped into him a little bit for being down injured but Fulham fans didn't do that and I just think that West Ham fans potentially using it as a little bit of an not an excuse but you know having a frustrated because they're two 0 down and they're and they're struggling and it's just it's easy to get kind of caught up in the moment and just have a bit of a pop at you know the team because you the opposition fans because your team aren't playing very well. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and we we had the minutes applause earlier in the game. We all clapped that. We then clapped him when he came off. It's not like we were going. Uh, we were singing songs about your injured player. It was, we were just singing, I can't remember what it was. It was just, you know, take me home, Alfa or something like that. It was, we were just having a good time. Um, and most of the, well, most, not most, some of the West Ham fans already left the ground by then. So, you know, you stay and support your team or you want to get back to Stratford early to, to beat the crowds, you know, that's fine. 
But to have a pop at the Fulham fans for singing um, on a very rare away occasion where you win a game just during an unfortunate moment where a player is down, yes, I can understand it, but it, it's a it's a point that just it, it's just we wish him well, and honestly. Um, I don't think that many other fan bases would make a big point of that. Not pointing at the West Ham fans at all, just saying that that was probably the fact they were 2 0 down, they were quite frustrated. There was a break in play. It might have pointed to the fact that they over they reacted in that way. Let's move on to Liverpool. Okay. Liverpool lost to the pride of South London, the famous Palace Boys, on Sunday at Anfield whilst we were playing at London Stadium. And I thought, crikey, that's that's some result for Palace. And um, we now play Liverpool. And I think they're vulnerable because they lost 3-0 to Atalanta, 1-0 to Palace. They've got to go to Bergamo tomorrow to play Atalanta in their second leg. And the tie looks done. It could be turned around. You never know. We've seen it before from Liverpool. So I think we'll have them. I think we could have them at the sausage at Craven Cottage. How do you see it going? I am the same. I honestly I'm obviously I'm I'm actually quite confident. Connor Bradley is also out for the game as well. He's mm. um he's out for a, three a new yeah, another a new a new injury for them. Um I just think we've had so much so many so been so close against Liverpool, you know, this season. And mm. I just think and we should last season we got a point against them. I just mm. I, I feel like it's it's brewing and we've got a bit of confidence about us and I, and I just I can see it kind of derailing a little bit for Liverpool between now and the end of the season. And, you know, I won't make my thoughts known on Jurgen Klopp, but I wouldn't be too upset if if their season was to derail um, and if Fulham were to play a bit of a hand in that. So, yeah. I, um, yeah, I'm, I actually think that Fulham are going to get a result out of this one. Yeah, no, it'd be, it'd be great. And I think Brentford are safe now. I was going to say if the four of our last five fixtures have we could have a say in the top and bottom, but I think it's now three out of five, which is fine. Um, Palace obviously on the beach, and Brentford probably secured survival um, against Sheffield United. Um, so Luton, and we have a, a say at the top with, with Liverpool and, and Manchester City. Uh, I think we'll get points at home out of at least one of these games. Um, and I think it's more likely it'll be Liverpool because they are quite fragile right now. And, and Man City, you know, whatever happens tomorrow night against Real Madrid, they might finally hit their stride. And a lot of people are saying it's done, it's over. It's not over. Liverpool beat us and, you know, City drop points on an up playing. They're playing the FA Cup. So actually City can make up that that point, uh, those points on City, put pressure back on them and they resume their league campaign uh, next week, I suppose. Um, and obviously Arsenal play Wolves, so they're playing Saturday night. So Liverpool will have a task on their hands. However, you know, we're in, we're in good spirits right now. We've hit 42 points. We, we've just won away from home with a clean sheet. I think Andres Pereira, for me, is the first name on the team sheet after uh, him and Calvin Bassi. So what would you change, if anything, from that starting eleven? We've had a whole week to prepare. Willian obviously started, um, as did Awobi and Pereira and Muniz and, you know, Paulinha and, and Sasha Lukic. So what would you change, if anything, because it doesn't seem like right now there needs to be an an, you know, an abundance of changes for this game. Honestly, I probably wouldn't change any of it if I'm if I'm mm. being perfectly honest. With you. I think I'd go unchanged if it's if it's not broke, don't fix it, kind of thing. And you know, we we played so well on on Sunday, um, you know. So I think I would you know, Leno and then the back four of Castagna and Tosin, Bassi and and Robinson. Polinia and Lukic, I think you could maybe make an argument for someone else instead of Sasha Lukic, but I think he had a good game. And Lukic seems to perform better against the sides up the top of the table. Um, mm. the, the teams where maybe Fulham won't see as much of the ball. Yeah. Um, where he can, when they do get the ball, he can be really good in transition and he's quite strong in the tackle as well next to Polinia. Pereira obviously starts. I think William plays as well. So, so. Will oh my god who played on the right? I've got oh Iwobi. Iwobi, Iwobi, sorry my mind went completely blank there. It won't be um he'll start and then obviously Rodrigo Muniz is going to play as well. So uh, yeah, I I don't really see any reason to to change it. To be perfectly honest with you, yeah, I think that's a good thing that we don't have to change it. You know, you could make an argument for Tom Kenny to come back in, but I ju I just think that the game suits Lukic. Um, I think expanded pitches also help Lukic. Um. We saw it at Old Trafford. We saw it at West Ham. These are big pitches, and he 
he got about well in both those games. But but at home, I think Lukic definitely starts. I think um, I think yeah, no changes whatsoever unless it's forced, unless there's an injury in training or or, or something of that ilk. But hopefully not. Um, and then look, this is this is big. This is big. If if we really put Liverpool under pressure and um, and get some points out of them and cause them some problems and we could effectively end their season on Sunday. If we won, you know, that's two defeats in a row in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, so that would be huge. And I think we would love that. I think there's a lot of people who don't want Klopp to have his farewell ending to his um, to his reign. Obviously, they can only win. They've won the League Cup. They can now still win the Premier League and the Europa League, but they're very much out of that conversation when it comes to the Europa League because they're 3-0 down against Atalanta. We Jack, we could end their season on Sunday. Is the point I was trying to make the headline. And I hope we do. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, what's uh, the score prediction then? I uh, I I'm gonna go over draw. I think one all. I think right. that, I I think that Fulham will take the lead um in the first half. Um They'll come back into it in the second half. Equalise maybe with about 20 minutes to go. Push for the second goal, but Fulham will hold firm. Leno will make a couple of really good stops. And I think it will be a point that Fulham deserve. Mm, that's quite specific. I will raise you with more, <laughs> more detail. <laughs> more niche. <laughs> more niche. I think that Fulham are going to draw as well. I think it might be another 2-2. I would also back 1-1. One, one. But the detail I'm really seeing here is I think Liverpool are going to get a red card in this game. There's actually been no games this season where Fulham have played a team and they've got a red card against us. No, It hasn't no, no, happened. It's fine, yeah. Um, I realised that when we played Newcastle. I think Liverpool are going to get a red card in this game. I can't specify who. Um, however... I think it's going to be a, it's going to be one of those very similar games to the opening game of the last season. I think Money Muniz is going to score. I think they'll equalise. I think someone will take the lead for Fulham in the second half. It might be Awobi. It might be Willian. Not sure. And then they'll equalise again, maybe from the penalty spot. Maybe uh, a very similar sort of goal to what they scored last season, like a little bit of a mix up at the back, and they and they score. But um, I think we'll take we'll take a point. And Liverpool will feel very frustrated because they, you know, they haven't capitalised on on City not playing. And yeah, I feel very confident that we can get something from the game. And and if we could win, even better, even better. Um, there was one more thing. Yes, there was a couple of things I wanted to ask you before we go. Um, first of all, we've survived. That's that. It's all over. Um, your thoughts on that? Fantastic, fantastic news. I mean, it's you know, after the summer that we had, there were. Certainly people who were a little bit concerned, not necessarily we were going to go down, but where were we going to be kind of in that conversation? And we soon kind of realised that that wasn't going to be the case because our home form particularly has been so strong this season. We've really made the cottage a fortress, which is something which might play into our hand on Sunday. Um, and I just hope now, now that we've, we're have we comfortable and that we're safe, you know, we can look to to build into next season in terms of, continuing to establish ourselves as a Premier League club because this has been a really good season. I think that, you know, while we're down in the in the, in the bottom half, it doesn't that doesn't signify a, a poor season. You know, we're on the same points total that we are last last time. And you know, the, the division has gotten stronger. You look at how much better Aston Villa are. Obviously Chelsea have improved a little bit um as well. The division has got stronger. Um the Wolves have improved as well under under Gary O'Neill. Mm. Um, so it's a good season, obviously semi final of the Carabao Cup as well. You know, it's been a it's been a it's been a very very good year. We've we're slowly starting to bring the age of the squad down in terms of if you look at the players in terms of our bench now. You know, in terms of our rotation options, we've got some really good players. Um, it's it's real. It's positive. It's positive times at Fulham. It's really positive times. It's honestly, it's great. It's great, and it was just such a nice sort of feeling to know that you've survived. On that final, um, on that on that game against um, West Ham, it was a nice way to do it as well. Just a nice London derby. Um, yeah, I, so to survive again is great at this stage of the season. 
Um, Marcus Silva has transformed. He's eradicated the yo-yo tag that comes with us, that came with us when we came up. Um, we survived one season. They went, well, second season syndrome, you never know. Someone told me, oh, yeah, no, Fulham won't score enough goals. And they were right up until one point. And, uh, and then we started bagging a load of goals uh, against Forest and, and West Ham. That was really when I started to be like, okay, we're a, we're a proper team now. And we still, we still are a proper team. We're very good. And we can only, we could get worse, but we can only really get better at this point. And hopefully the board and the manager and everyone, the staff of the club are thinking long-term. They're thinking about contract renewals. They're thinking about summer signings. And that was my final question for you, Jack. You know, I've, I've, we spoke, I've spoken with Joe about what we want in the summer, but what do you want in the summer for Fulham? Or positions, maybe even players. It's quite hard because this very, very likable squad. You don't want to sort of replace individual players, but if they could add to it and maybe, I don't know what's because, you know, a couple of weeks ago we were saying, oh, we could sell Andres Pereira, but now I'm kind of like, oh, actually, he's quite a good player, is our Andres Pereira. And also, it's worth noting, even though sometimes on the ball, he can be a bit wasteful. His off the ball pressing is always very, very impressive. We should never forget that. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the summer, um, it's very dependent again on kind of departures and what happens. Because obviously, Tosin's out of contract. I'm starting to think that he's going to go. Um, Kenny Tete um, is out of contract, but we do have an extension on him. So the I wouldn't trigger, be surprised. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we trigger that extension. But then he might kind of want to go and play first team football which i wouldn't blame him for because i think he's an unbelievable footballer it could mm. be a kind of a thing of we, we we trigger the extension and then we and, we, and then we sell just mm. so we get some kind of money for him um so i think a center back definitely is probably needed especially if tosin goes i think a center back is necessary um same again if tete goes you probably need a right back if he doesn't go then obviously not you're going to need someone else um to deputize for anthony robinson obviously because balotori is not going to be here um, yeah. there's, there's another argument is Anthony Robinson going to stay I think he's going to demand mm. some kind of interest subject, in the summer yeah. um, mm -hmm. I think Polinia I actually think Polinia is going to, going to stay put to be honest with you I don't think anyone's really? going to put the I don't think anyone's going to want to pay the fee that we're going to demand for him just because not because of ability because I think he's unbelievable but I think because of age people nowadays want younger players who are going to be with them for a long period of time so I think Polinia will probably stay um in terms of who, then you've got Willian. I saw some kind of report the other day that you know he's looking at potentially his options elsewhere. Then you've got obviously the striker Brozier is going to go back. So I don't think we really need to do loads. And also as well, I don't know how restrictive we're going to be with the with the PSR and FFP and that sort of thing as well. So I think just kind of plug in a couple of gaps, you know, just boosting boosting the squad a little bit. If you were to kind of ask me for names. We probably need a a, a, a a depth option for Polinia. Um, if mm -hmm. he is going to stay, you need another six. So uh, if you offer, ask me for a name now, I quite like, as a rotation option, I quite like Vinny Souza at Sheffield United. I think he's a, yeah. he's a very good player. So he's someone who you could potentially look at. Um, again, and Andres Pereira, probably going to keep. But you'd maybe like to have another option, but then maybe not because you've got a Wobi who could go into that position as well. Yeah, so it's tricky. Uh, it's, it's tricky because you you don't want to disrupt the harmony too much of the squad, but then you also need to kind of realize that you know if you don't improve, everyone else is going to, and then you, you start to drop down a little bit. So maybe just one or two gaps, and then you know look at who's if anyone's going to go because if Tosin goes, um, you probably need a, a starting centre back. Mm. Um, and I think as well, even if William does stay, I wouldn't be against signing another winger who would come in and would start pretty quickly because Willian is unbelievable. He's been fantastic for us, but obviously at his age, there's no guarantee that he's going to keep this up. We say it, we know, we said it last summer, we said it this summer, but I think from the Willian stance for me now, is like, well, he's, he's phenomenal, class is permanent, but it wouldn't fuss me as much as it did last summer when he was rumoured to be leaving that he, if he didn't stay on again, because I, it's nothing against him personally. I, I love him, love him to bits. But two years of service he's given us, and he's been brilliant. And it feels like if he did want just one last hurrah, and he wanted to go somewhere in Brazil, or he wanted to go somewhere else, I could sort of be like, you know what? Fair enough. You've gave us some really good times, some really good memories, um, some really good contributions. Um, I think I'd rather have him here than not. But I wouldn't actually begrudge him to want that one last sort of 
adventure. Um, and, and, and also, uh, I, yeah, I was going to say, I was also going to say as well with that, obviously you said last season compared to this season, you look as well in terms of our options off the bench and stuff in terms of the squad depth, we've improved so much in terms of you, mm. if you, you add a Wobi and Adama Traore into mm. that as well. Um, you know, losing Willian wouldn't be so disastrous. Whereas yeah. last season, obviously, we lost Manuel Solomon and we didn't really have anyone else. And then if you were to lose Willian on top of oh, that, no, as well. and Kabat, you're looking for two players on that left-hand side. Whereas if you lose Willian now, you're only looking for one. And they, mm. you want him to be a starter, but even if there's someone who's going to grow and develop, it doesn't really matter too much because you've got Alex Awobi who could play out on, on that left-hand side. And on the right as well. And um, yeah. Obviously, Shirky was a player we were linked with in January, albeit at the last minute. So he might be someone we revisit again. Um, so, yeah, I, I, it's hard to identify specific names. You don't know what sort of markets they're looking into, what sort of area. I mean, Callum O'Hare is a player that I would quite like down at Craven Cottage, even if they went down a double, well, they will go down from a double sweep of um, Gus Hamer and... Sorry, hold on. Gus Hamer's at Sheffield United. Sheffield right? United. Gus Hamer yeah. is at Sheffield United. Yes. Yeah, I got confused. Um, yeah, Hamer and yeah. Susan I I am I I am I have a first class ticket to the Gus Hamer train, and ah. I am I am I am never leaving. I think he's such a good footballer. Choo choo, and look, I mean, someone put it on Twitter today, and it, it didn't get much traction. But I didn't w actually watch his analysis. His punditry, Delhi Alley. You know, someone was like, oh, I reckon Marcus Silva gets so much out of Deli Alley. And I'm thinking, yeah, maybe. I mean, it would be really cool to actually, the, re the rehabilitation, quite literally, of Deli Alley. And if he came down to Craven Cottage and, and, and started purring under Marco Silva, I think that would be really cool. However, you know, that's that's just, that's just like someone put it on Twitter and I had a little think about it and thought, yeah, that'd be quite fun. Um We've gone longer than I thought we would today, but no harm in that. Um, and yeah, that's it. Fulham will be in the Premier League next season. Fine. Happy days. Um, and hopefully, you know, hopefully we do upgrade. The, I think the incomings will very much depend on the outgoings. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, can we spend bef before we sell? I don't know. Will Robinson go? Will Paulinho go? This will all be answered in the summer, but it's good to talk about it. Jack? Um, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, enjoy the game on Sunday, um, albeit there probably will be 5,000 Liverpool fans sat in the Hammersmith end because of how expensive ticket prices are. But that is that is another story. Um, enjoy the game. Um, and, yeah, I think that we're going to get something out of it. Yeah. Bring it on. Um yeah, we might see the season ticket prices come out very soon. So actually, that will be worth looking for. Shout out to <laughs> shout out to Martin, who I met in the concourse <laughs> at West Ham, and he spilt his tea quite literally everywhere. And it was one of the most funniest things I've ever seen. But it was really fun to meet him. He was a lovely guy. And of course, shout out to um, I mentioned him before, but I'm going to give him another shout out to uh, Stuart Roberts, Peter Roberts, James Roberts, Lucas Roberts, and Max as well. I shan't forget Max. Thank you so much for your support. I saw you before the Newcastle game and you kept going, oh, shout out Max on the Jack and Joe show. Well, here we are. Max, hello. Thank you for watching. Thank you for being part of the community. Um, I'll tell you what, the, the support on the channel this season has been really good and we're growing day by day. We're almost at 6.2K subs, which is very exciting. Um, Jack, a pleasure as always. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for watching. And uh, yeah, come on Fulham, as Jack always says. Yeah, literally, honestly, come on Fulham um, is is something I say every week, obviously, because we like Fulham, don't we? Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's time to it's time to make dinner, I think. Um, thanks so much for watching. Enjoy the Champions League. Enjoy uh, the Liverpool game. Hopefully see you. Uh, some of you in the concourse beforehand and uh, hopefully this time the tea won't be flying up in the air <laughs> come on Fulham <laughs>